across the street that I had in front of uh, Lee High School. And uh, a call came from Atlanta Highway down Ann Street, high rate of speed, and uh, hit two pedestrians crossing Ann Street. It looked like one of the ladies might have uh, went under the car and he run over her. And then uh, the other lady was on the hood of the car for, say, 50 feet. We start with Peter Jacobson, who won the Colonial last week. He was never in it at the Memorial, but he had a memorable finish here on the final hole. The ball backs up right into the hole for Eagle 2. Jacobson finished at even par. Jack Nicholas was tied with Chip Beck for the lead on the 12th hole. Nicholas had this birdie putt to go nine under par. Nicholas sends it right into the hole to take sole possession of the lead. But Nicholas bogeyed the 13th. So Chip Beck was tied for the lead once more, but it didn't last long. His tee shot on the 14th goes way to the right. It flies out of bounds. Beck took double bogey and was never back in it. To the 16th hole we go. Andy Bean stands one shot back of Jack Nicholas for the lead. This birdie putt could put him into a tie at nine under par. Bean gains a share of the lead with the birdie putt. So with Bean and Nicholas tied for the lead, Nicholas hits his tee shot on 17, and you can see the reaction of Nicholas. It was not a good one. He hit it out of bounds and onto a patio of a house. Nicholas made bogey and fell one shot back of Bean at eight under par. All Bean had to do was to make par on the final hole to win, but as putt slid by, he and Nicholas went to sudden death. And then on the third hole of sudden death, after Nicholas made par, Bean had this par putt to keep the playoff going, but it slid by, and Jack Nicholas wins the Memorial Tournament in sudden death over Andy Bean. There you go. Have a good day. Hope you enjoy.
more than we yeah. ever hoped that's for. Right. That's the problem. It'd be jam packed. Right. How much are one of these things? Three Thank you very much, Stan, and we appreciate each of you being here. Once again, the entire week has been proclaimed Hank I saw the light, I saw the light, no more darkness. I'm going to read a, uh, a read a statement, and then, uh, and I believe that anybody that takes such a job has a has a judges need to have common sense to interpret the law, and must be responsible enough to look down the road and see the effect their decisions may have. The people of Alabama deserve quick, just action against criminals who might otherwise slip through the system. I intend to exercise every effort to provide the swift, swiftest, fairest justice and to protect the rights of all people of Alabama. Was there a fight against the second part of the provision, or have they been the other way? I believe, that they, I believe that the courts have changed uh, somewhat in the last 20 to people who do them. So I believe that the, uh, I believe that the, the death penalty will State pending appeal. The notice of appeal. This is an order signed. The insurance department has no information. Intervening factors and arbitrary and capricious conduct that surrounded these proceedings in the Alabama Department of Insurance, it would be in the best interest of the citizens of this state and the interested parties of this proceeding that the plaintiffs in this section now. In Judge Kennedy's order, he addressed whether or not the insurance. The policyholders then in existence would be protected. That's basically what it is, which everybody agrees. Dismissal in a case filed in the Middle District of Alabama, your certificate of authority, because it didn't provide enough here. So the DeBellis order was entered to remedy those defects from. I'll be thinking about that objective, accomplishing it and doing nothing else but accomplishing that objective. Anthony McLeod has one objective, to get a job. It gets him up in the morning. It's the reason he pulls on the same worn jacket every day, and it's why he walks for miles, since he can't afford a car. Hey, are you looking for work today? Yes. One instance for this insurance company, I applied there in the an employee indicated that he would contact me, but I didn't have a telephone, you know, so it was hard for him to contact me, nor did I have transportation, so that made it doubly hard for me to uh, get in contact with him. And as a result, I believe I lost that, that job. Anthony is 27, he has a college degree, and he left his last full-time job in 79 to take advanced classes in business administration. Sometimes he thinks all his education hasn't done him much good. I go here and I apply for a job, and he says either a no response or a negative response, and, and uh, I, I can't say exactly what it is. Okay, we'll put it with the rest of them and have them mailed out for you. Oh, I, I feel as though there's no way out of, of the number. Anthony ran out of money long ago. What he's holding on to is his pride 
and his determination. It's that desire to accomplish something, to be someone. I've always been taught to, to, to make something out of myself. Uh, I've always uh, I've worked hard, I've gone to school, you know, to, to become someone. And, and I guess that ambition alone is what keeps me, keeps me after that. Susan Silvernail, WSFA TV News. Sharon Brooks says she almost expects to hear it now. So many times she's been told, we'll call you, and then she waits for a telephone call that doesn't come. Sharon has been looking for work since she graduated from Carver High last year. She feels she's ready to be independent. It is hard because you have to turn to your parents and ask them to buy you something, and they don't have the money because they have their bills to pay. It's hard. Sharon is one of 16,000 black teenagers looking for a job in the state. Frankly, the odds of Sharon finding work soon aren't good. The unemployment rate for Alabama's black teenagers is 56.4, which is more than double that of any other group. I want to go back to school because I can't find a job. Will the school help you get a job, you think? Yes, it will, but the job will help me get to school. <laughs> Every day I, when the paper come, I go and get the paper, you know, and look in the one ass, and I, the next morning I get up, me and my mother will go to the fill out application where I like. Mm -hmm. But Valerie won't even get that far today. A factory job is what she's asking about, but it isn't what she dreams about. I want to be a fashion designer. I like to sew, and I like a lot of clothes, and I like to model. That's why I want to be a fashion designer. I don't know what that might turn to if they if they can't find a job. When Valerie goes job hunting, it's her mother who's behind her, driving her to interviews and encouraging her. I told her to keep looking. Something's gonna break and anything that she can find, a half a loaf is better than no loaf, you know? So, see, she won't give up. Susan Silvernail, WSFA TV News. What about little boy swim trunks? When Ed Pardue was really down and out, the Salvation Army helped him. Now that he's struggling to get back on his feet, he helps the Salvation Army. The worst of it was two years ago. Both he and his wife Cheryl were in the hospital for a long time, and they lost their jobs. Cheryl just found part-time work, but Ed can't find a steady, full-time position. Uh, it's hard to make a budget. Uh, not knowing from week to week or even month to month uh, if you can make your commitments. We're both very worried because we can't meet those obligations. And it's a lot of people maybe don't worry like we do, but we were used to it. One time we paid our utility bills and didn't think a thing about it. There is a lot of sleepless nights. There is a lot of days of worry. When Ed is not job hunting, he likes to be at the Salvation Army. It reminds him there are people with even bigger problems, and it fills time. Uh, it's very hard to just sit and do nothing. Uh, I'm not the type that likes to be idle. I think it's worse on your nerves uh, and your outlook if, if you're not doing anything. Uh, like when the wife. The Pardues weren't used to taking help from friends or neighbors, although they say that help has made all the difference. They thought they'd be further ahead by now. They had plans and dreams they can't be as sure about anymore. Ed has several prospects of a job, maybe part-time employment, but something, you know, anything would help. It, it, it makes you wonder if you can ever get your life straightened back out again and go ahead like you were before. Uh, you just had to learn to lead a new, complete life all over again. Susan Silvernail. WSFA TV News. I realize that there's a lot of people that probably have a lot more problems than I do. Uh, then there's probably some people that don't.
record crowd of 150,000 fans turned out at the Charlotte Motor Speedway this holiday weekend for the 25th anniversary of the World 600. Harry Gant in car number 33 started from the number one spot, but before two laps were complete, Darrell Waltrip in car number 11 grabbed the lead. From there, the lead changed hands several times with Terry Labonte, Bobby Allison, Dale Earnhardt, and Cale Yarborough all taking a crack at the lead. Uncharacteristically, the race was more than half over before the Winston Cup drivers got a chance to relax. The first caution came out on lap 221 when Trevor Boys in car 48 and Terry Labonte in car 44 tangled in turn three. 27 laps later, rain soaked the speedway and the second caution appeared. Several laps after that, Darrell Waltrip ran over some debris and crashed on the backstretch. At the same time, the rains came again, and the race was stopped for a short period. When the race resumed, Cale Yarborough in car 28 was clearly the man to beat. And Bobby Allison in car number 22 took on the challenge. Late in the contest, Jimmy Means crashed on the backstretch, and that brought the pack together again. Allison and Yarborough were locked in a battle to the finish. Door handle to door handle, they raced until 16 laps to the end. Yarbrough's engine went up in smoke in turn one. His hope for his first World 600 victory was gone. Allison breezed to the checkered flag several seconds ahead of Dale Earnhardt and the rest of the pack. Thank you, Bill. Well, today's the day that I hope 20 years from now, your job, the business that we intend to do in Abbeville will be a combination of military and commercial. And it's been my experience over the years that in order to maintain a level employment and to keep paying your bills and making some money, you can't really be tied down to one particular product or one particular military or commercial. Today. We're here today to announce the location of a new plant here at the airport in Troy by Sikorsky. Sikorsky Aircraft out of Connecticut plans to sink about three million dollars in South Alabama. That gets the company space by the Troy airport to overhaul and repair military aircraft. Sikorsky officials say the company is going after what they call the aftermarket support business. Translation. Sikorsky will be hiring 75 to 100 workers in the Troy area. 
that it's our success here will determine how big the facility will ultimately be. And that will be up to us and to all of the community working together. Sikorsky was welcomed to Troy by the city's mayor, Jimmy Lunsford, Pike County Chamber of Commerce, and by a long-distance telephone call. And we are happy to have this uh, another United Technologies plant. That Governor Wallace called from Montgomery to say Alabama was more than happy to make room for a second Sikorsky plant. The company is building a facility in Elmore County that should open mid-1985. The Troy plant is also scheduled to open next year. Susan Silvernail, WSFA TV News, Troy. The favorable report was substituted with amendments, and it was read a second time in front of former members. And further, uh, and I think it's a very serious problem that they may be hurting. I would make a comment on this statement, but uh, I, I, would some, I would have some feeling. There are as many potential bowlers in Montgomery as there are people. 183,509, according to the latest census projection. There are more than 2,500 league bowlers using the city's four bowling centers. Those are people who bowl on a team at least once a week on a regular basis. I like the competitiveness of it. Uh, it's a place that a female can go without an escort. I, it's a sport that age, strength, doesn't matter. In most cases, bowlers in her league play and expect to take home trophies or ribbons. But these Florida league bowlers here at Bama Lanes are special. At the end of the league play, they pack up and head to Florida. Our dues and all help pay for a trip to Florida for the bowling league. And we usually have a real good time down there, party some, go to the dog track, all this. Everybody, everybody that's bowled together becomes good friends and go down and just have a great time in Florida. One good thing about the sport of bowling is you're never too old to bowl. Just ask the Swinging Seniors, a group of senior citizens who bowl each Wednesday here at Montgomery Lanes. It's really an art to knock down 10 pounds with one ball. And so, for goodness sake, I've always, I've always taken the challenge. You know, whooped me a lot of times, but for goodness sake, I will come back for more every time. The exercise, being with the people, having something to do. I enjoy that. I've been doing about four years. One of the oldest members of the Swinging Seniors is 82-year-old Effie Colvin. She wouldn't miss an outing and explains why. The group and throwing that little ball is the funnest thing in the world because it's too heavy, though, but I throw it anyway. Thanks to the Montgomery City Parks and Recreation Department, these senior citizens aren't getting to be any older. They're just getting to be better bowlers. Tournament tennis has its place in Montgomery. The Blue Gray College Tournament was held here in March, and the Capital City Classic attracted hundreds of entries last weekend. But there is also a place in Montgomery for those of us who enjoy the game in a non-tournament atmosphere. Here at the O'Connor Tennis Center, pro Charlie Lane tries to have something different for his players just about every day. This happens to be the round robin for ladies. The general feeling you get from talking to these players is that the sport of tennis isn't just for some, it's for everyone. Far more exercise than you get with golf or bowling. And I prefer it. It's a companionship game. You meet a lot of ladies out here. Alma Glover comes from a tennis family. Dot Furlong does not, but she gets just as much out of the game. It's great fun. I enjoy it. Uh, I get out and I run around. I meet lots of very nice women that I wouldn't meet otherwise. Art Isola is a school teacher at Cloverdale Junior High School. After school, he teaches junior tennis players at Lagoon Park. Art insists it's never too early to start playing. When do you start, say, training a youngster? When a youngster is, uh, is strong enough to pick up a racket and hold it and able to swing it and control it. One of Art's students is 14-year-old Linda Kim, a tournament player who first picked up a racket at age eight. My mother and my brother play tennis. Did they ever encourage you at one point to, to pick up a racket? Yeah, my mother did. Your family members, a lot of them play golf and yet you play tennis. Does anybody else in your family plays? Um, my sister used to play a whole lot and she still plays some. 
Another Montgomery tennis family, the Bushmans, Jack and Jackie, were instrumental in bringing back the Blue Gray College Tournament. Jackie, who is Lagoon Park's professional, attributes much of the tournament's success to support from the city's tennis community. Our sponsors were from a lot of our businessmen that, you know, that put up the money to, you know, bring in, you know, the players and, you know, trophies and, you know, various expenses. You know, our various families across town are the ones that house these young, you know, young men. And they're the ones that came out and supported it. Yes, Montgomery is a tennis town. This is a site for Henry County's newest industry, the Abbeville Industrial Park. This is where Teledyne Incorporated will build a plant to assemble new aircraft alternators. For the time being, the company is operating out of this building, but the plans for the permanent facility are much bigger. We went out and looked at your industrial park, <clears throat> and I was very pleased with it. I think we have a good location out there, and we'll be looking forward to when we start a building program. Bigler will not say how big the plant will be or how many people it will employ. He does say the plant will be an important part of Abbeville with a combination of military and commercial business. In order to maintain a level employment and to keep paying your bills and making some money, you can't really be tied down to one particular product or one particular military or commercial. So I like to mix it up. It's that military business that interests the area's congressman who says it's important that more defense dollars are coming to the wiregrass. A baby doesn't start big. You never know how big it's going to grow. But it's a good thing to have because we know what the future holds to some degree at least. Cal Camelway, WSFA TV News, Abbeville. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a, uh, some time constraints here. I understand that at 240. It's almost three million. Anyone? I suppose the congressman would be in the same situation to answer. We have very high hopes that there are many aircraft in the field to be modified, and we want to do that work in Troy, Alabama. I don't know how many times I've been up to visit uh, Sikorsky two or three. The people in the community, their attitudes, their willingness, their friendliness, the quality of life there for their employee, their, their prospective employees. Now, as to what impact economically and otherwise the facility in Tallahassee would have in the area and particularly as it relates to Montgomery. Now this was done as related
Police Director, the Head of External Correctional Services, Warden at Draper, Warden at Fountain. Effective June 9th, I reassigned uh, Warden Murphy as a Deputy Warden at our Holman facility in Atmore. I have reviewed the investigative report of, uh, uh, pertaining to an escape from his house, and I've also reviewed all the minutes of an administrative hearing that was held on May the 2nd pertaining to the charges that were brought against him, and this is my decision. Dennis, simply beautiful, huh? That's right, Kim. It was uh, all awe inspiring. The uh, sun got dim and the uh, annulus ring came out, and it was almost like it was about to get dark. It was uh, something that I don't think I'll ever forget. It, uh, it got cold. And of course, the wind was blowing, and you would have—you never thought that it was the, almost the last day of May. And I think we have some tapes so we can show you a little bit of what what it looked like when it happened here, right about the 11:17. And you're seeing there the moon uh, moving in front of the sun, um, and it's not not able to block out the entire sun because the moon is just a little bit uh, further out from the Earth than it would be during a total eclipse. And what you have there is an annular eclipse. I have with me the president of the Birmingham Astronomical Society, Carolyn Jackson, and there were a lot of predictions made about all the spectacular things you would be able to see, the Bailey's beads and the diamond ring effect. Uh, uh, what did you think about the annular eclipse? Oh, I thought it was wonderful. I could see the mountain to the moon breaking the rim of sunlight around the sun, but I didn't see the Bailey's beads. I think they probably saw them better further east toward Virginia but we could see very well the broken annularity, the mountain to the moon breaking the rim of the sun. Now, their next solar eclipse that will be any time uh, close to us is not going to be around here. Do you think there'll be a lot of people having seen one might uh, go travel a far distance to see another one? I think once you've seen one, you're bitten by the bug, and you just have to see the next one if you can get to it. Other than uh, looking at it to observe and witness the, the event, there are some scientific aspects to uh, an eclipse of the sun. What are some of the things that scientists look at when the sun is eclipsed? Okay, the U.S. Naval Observatory has amateurs all along the path making timings of the appearance of the beads and the broken annularity. And from this, they can get very accurate measurements of the diameter of the sun as it appears from us and the profile of the moon and its mountains and valleys. So that's what they're looking at for today. Thank you very much. Kim, as you can see, there's uh, not only uh, some pleasure and just sheer joy of observation, there's also some scientific uh, experiments and, and uh, data that can be gathered during this annular eclipse of the sun. And we'll be telling you more about that at 6 o'clock tonight. Kim? Okay, Dennis, thank you very much. Eclipse watchers came from all over, Arizona, Kentucky, Tennessee and they brought with them a fortune in the latest high-powered telescopes and solar filtering systems. But there were those who spent very little and got just about as good a look at the annular eclipse. And some didn't settle for just one image of the eclipsed sun. They were able to produce dozens of projections. There was even an appearance of the edible viewing device. A cheese cracker held a couple of feet over a white piece of paper. When you get finished viewing, you start eating. The actual eclipse was spread out over several hours. This is what the sun looked like at 1016, the moon just beginning to pass in front. At 1051, even more was blocked. By 11 a.m., the sun was beginning to look more like a crescent moon. And at 1107, the light was really beginning to fade. Depending on who you ask, the annular effect lasted between 11 and 35 seconds. But the watched-for Bailey's beads or the diamond ring effect didn't appear too distinctly at our location. Hugh Earle, a microbiologist and amateur astronomer, came all the way from Madisonville, Kentucky, to peer through his telescope at the annular eclipse. Uh, this is the last annularity, perhaps in my lifetime. Thus, a 370-mile trip is well worth it. If you're fired up, so to speak, over solar eclipses and you don't want to travel more than a continent to see another one, you might try southern Mexico on July 11th, 1991. The next solar eclipse coming anywhere close to us is a long way off. How about August the 21st, 2017? I'll see you there, Bob. Okay. <laughs> Are you looking forward to it? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, they were ready for the eclipse, and so was almost everybody else in downtown Montgomery. So it's not surprising that despite the warnings, many people took their chances and tried to watch the moon's progress across the sun. 
The moon's partially covering the sun there. Hopefully in a while it'll be all the way over. It's amazing. I'm just afraid to look at the sun. My mother won't let me go out though because she thinks it's dangerous for the eyesight. Then the big moment. Looking up Dexter Avenue, it grew steadily darker. Car lights came on. Work stopped in some places. And then, just when everyone thought the darkest moment was at hand, it got lighter. It was over. Something like I ain't never seen before. <laughs> some new, you know. To me it is, anyway. I don't know. It's an eclipse. Of course, there were some astounding sights, like the way a tree's leaves projected dozens of images of the eclipse on the pavement. And as you might expect, some people didn't know what was happening in the first place. Sort of scary. But overall, it seems, the great eclipse wasn't what everyone expected. It like it was cloudy, but it wasn't really, it wasn't cloudy. Oh, it was pretty exciting. It wasn't what I expected. I thought it might get pitch dark, but it did. I guess people figure you wait all this time for an eclipse, it ought to be really spectacular. It ought to knock your eyes out. Well, I guess we'll just have to wait for the next one. Tom Foreman, WSFA, TV News. The sun, the fire of life, it shines relentlessly from 93 million miles away. But once in a while, the moon passes in front of the sun, causing temporary darkness for those caught in its shadow. On Wednesday, the moon won't quite block out all of the sun, so what we'll have is an annular eclipse. The moon is slightly farther out in its orbit, and therefore it does not quite cover the solar disk, and therefore we will see a ring when the uh, annularity occurs, or the greatest uh, covering of the solar disk occurs. So we'll see a ring rather than having the entire sun blocked out. The moon's shadow begins its journey across the Earth far out in the Pacific Ocean. Screaming across the planet at thousands of miles an hour, the shadow slices through Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama. Montgomery is only about 15 miles south of the prime viewing line. And it's along this path of annularity that some amazing things can happen. Since there are mountains on the moon, along the limb particularly, you will see the sun coming through some lunar valleys, and this will give you perhaps a diamond ring effect, or several, which are called Bailey's beads. You might also be able to see uh, solar flares, but I, I'm not sure about this, because this ring is going to be rather bright. While our attention is focused on the sky during the eclipse, other events caused by the darkening sky may begin to take place. There are several things that uh, might be very interesting. One is, is the temperature might drop about 10 degrees. It will also get rather dark, sort of twilight-like. And you might even see uh, shadow bands moving across the ground, uh, preceding and following the eclipse. And you also might see birds possibly trying to go to roost. If you plan to stake out a rooster of your own to see the eclipse, you might travel up I-65 north to the Pine Level exit, or go to Deedsville or Otogaville. If you want to stay in Montgomery, you can come to the planetarium here at Oak Park. The eclipse should begin about 10 a.m. with the annular effect at 1118. But you'd better be quick because the ring of fire may only last about 10 seconds. Dennis Latham, WSFA TV News. This is a photograph of the retina of the human eye. Everything you see is focused on this delicate membrane. But even the sunlight escaping around an eclipsed sun is enough to permanently injure your retina. The uh, danger, Dennis, with the eclipse is the thermal effect of the heat energy on the retina of the eye. Similar to where you've maybe as a child taken a uh, magnifying glass focused uh, sun uh, light rays onto a piece of paper and actually burned a hole in the piece of paper. That's this, in effect what you would be doing. That's what you would be doing, exactly what you'd be doing. And your the lens of your eye and the uh, uh, focusing ability of your eye acts just like a, uh, a magnifying glass to bring the light rays into focus on the retina. Dr. Hatcher says if you must look at the eclipse, only look at a projected image of the sun. Stay away from any direct viewing, even with a filter. He says probably the best way to see this spectacular event is to watch it on television. Dennis Latham, WSFA TV News. This is Air Command and Staff College, and soon the students who have been attending this demanding school for the past 10 months will be graduating. As part of the graduation, 23 of the living legends of aviation history have assembled here for what's being called the third annual Gathering of Eagles. 
Several of the Eagles are household names, like Chuck Yeager. Others are not known so much by name, but by deed. For example, squadron leader Brom Vanderstock. He's Holland's top ace, and one of only three men who successfully made it to freedom in the Great Escape. He says he's honored to be part of the gathering of Eagles and to be able to meet and talk with other aces and young Air Force officers. He says fighter pilots belong to a special fraternity that transcends time or even enemies that once met in combat. It's either a very short encounter or you have a little longer a dogfight, but it's still not a truly a, a personal thing. He doesn't know me and I don't know him. Vanderstock was a young medical student when the war broke out. He says his most vivid memory was his first taste of combat. It was May 10, 1940. He was on a routine patrol as a reserve officer in the Dutch Air Force when all of a sudden a flight of German fighters attacked. We developed in quite a, an old-fashioned dogfight with at least 20 aircraft there right above the airfield. Minutes after the encounter, Holland declared war on Germany. That just and shortly thereafter, Vanderstock was forced to flee his country radio, as the Germans took control just, just four days later. Don Phelps, WSFA TV News on the military beat. So that was my first exposure, and that, that was. Yes. So, uh, if you'd like to have a copy, would you like to have a copy? Would you like to have a copy? <clears throat> just, just show you the uh, way off. We're trying to serve as many children as we can. However, there's a limitation on, <clears throat> on resources and funds being one of those major resources. We lost the half. These folks did it though. Yeah. Well, I did just, have done it without, well, I did just sign it. That's, all, that's easy to do, you know. Thank you, we our appreciate friend. It. Thank you, sir. Thank you, honey. We want one on the uh, so many times they have tremendous hospital bills. They have loss of time from work. Uh, they have so many times psychiatric bills or doctor bills. State in the Union that had it when I spoke to them. We used to build in Washington a few years later. The convention told me they were going right on up to their state. They're going right to the Congress with it. We need to uh, do something to express our appreciation to these uh, law enforcement officers and their families for the risk that they're taking. Uh, $20,000 is not much for our lives but it does express our appreciation, and it does cause the rest of us to realize the risk that these people are facing every day. I'll tell you a little bit about uh, what we're doing in that area, and uh, a little bit about the importation from all of the states in the United States chosen for the industrial pay toilet of the world. There's got to be more of a reason. Well, uh, one of the I'm not trying to be an alarmist. I'm not trying to scare people to death. But there's got to be a reason why we were chosen as a state and why Sumter County in this state was chosen for the industrial pay toilet of the world. There's got to be more of a reason than just politics as usual. Alabama has executed 687 of its citizens. 18 have been women. The last woman executed by this state was Rhonda Bell Martin, who was electrocuted October 11, 1957. Ms. Martin was convicted of killing family members by poisoning. The state now holds 70 inmates on death row. Two of those are women. 20-year-old Judith Ann Neely is sentenced to die for the murder of a 13-year-old girl. Pat Thomas is scheduled to die for her second killing. She's 36. Both women are kept here at Tutwiler Prison in Wetumpka. 
Warden Kathleen Hope. Women that are housed on death row are totally isolated from the other population. They live in a, a one-woman uh, cell, and uh, they don't have any contact other than when their officers are in and out to check them and, and to take care of them. And then the cleaning uh, person does the outside real cleaning of the, of the grills, but then they do their own cleaning inside, so they have no contact with the population inside the institution. What Espy is regarded as the world authority on capital punishment. Espy has completed hours of research on over 14,000 executions in the U.S. Espy says there's a reason only two of this state's 70 condemned inmates are women. Throughout history, we have tended to be much more lenient on female offenders than we have on male offenders, and I think that uh, holds true today, as might be demonstrated by the numbers on death row here in Alabama today. There are only two women out of, I believe, a little over 70 persons who now stand condemned to die for transgressions that have been committed in taking the lives of another human being. Both Judith Neely and Pat Thomas have explanations for the killings they are here for. They are completely different. Two against one. When our little boy allowed, she had a knife, I had a knife, and one had a gun. I ain't end up coming to prison, and one end up dying. Being a battered woman is something that a man cannot understand. And a woman can't understand it unless she goes through it. This is Norman Lumpkin, WSFA TV News, Tutwiler Prison. Judith Ann Neely says she was a young girl when she met her husband. She now blames him and his abuse of her for her part in the torture slaying of a 13-year-old girl. One of these incidents seemed to incense a lot of people. It involves a 13-year-old girl who was shot and injected with uh, some caustic materials and then pushed over a cliff. Can you tell me what your husband did to make you do that? I don't want to go into that, please. Does that bother you? Very much. Have you had any conversation with the family of this person, this victim? No, I haven't. Have you ridden them, called them, or anything like that? No. Neely says she hasn't given up hope that she might escape the electric chair. I'm always hopeful. I haven't given up hope. I won't stop uh, living just because I'm on death, but I won't give it up. I'll keep fighting until there's not a breath left in me. This is Norman Lumpkin, WSFA TV News, Tutwiler Prison. It's hard knowing that a person got your life in their hands. You just live in fear, you know, you don't, you be, I am scared that one of them just makes the way, you know, you're going to kill them. Patricia Thomas has led a life filled with alcohol and violence. This is her second time in prison. Her first sentence was 20 years ago for second degree murder. For that crime, she served 10 years. 20 years later, she has one appeal left on a death sentence for stabbing another woman to death during a drinking spree in Tuscaloosa several years ago. Thomas admits she was drunk at the time, but says she was justified. It's two against one. When our little boy allowed, she had a knife, I had a knife, and one had a gun, and I ended up coming to prison, and one ended up dying. Pat Thomas has one legal appeal of her death sentence left. This is Norman Lumpkin, WSFA TV News, Tutwiler Prison. Even with that man, and by the same token, I sincerely hope and trust that every job that municipal employee is filled with creative. This job I knew going to work with compensation legislation. In my opinion, the party pulled into the car. I made it absolutely clear at our initial meeting that our group would very possibly be in this country. Unfortunately, or fortunately, unfortunately, people in my district 
trial lawyer did a good job. I hired the same man. I selected to the Senate. So you see what can happen. But you came out of uh, a, a, a great lawyer, a great lawyer that knows what he's talking about. He's talking to a graduate class of one of our great universities. And now he's hit me before, but he's never hurt me this bad. I don't think he really meant to. Bell well, County children are learning about child abuse from puppets. This seems to be a very effective way. Uh, the students can really relate to puppets, and some of the other Parents Anonymous chapters throughout the state have used these, and they have reported very good success. Many times after a puppet show, uh, students will come forward and report an abuse that has happened to them. The local chapter wants to keep these youngsters from becoming victims. Authorities say three abused children died in Dale County last year, and there were more than 300 abuse complaints filed with local authorities. That's why work. Parents Anonymous wants to help. You, you mean you've never had bruises or scratches from a spanking? No, and you really need to talk to someone about this. Not to get your dad in trouble or anything, but so he can get help. Mary Beth Boyd, there. WSFA Ow. TV News, he, Ozark. He feels, he does that. He feels fine to me. Military personnel and their dependents are fortunate enough to play on two of the city's finest golf courses at Maxwell Air Force Base. Three of the holes made our top 18. We're going to take a look at the par 3 13th hole, 217 yards in length. It's usually a log iron or a wood for most of the amateur players. And, but, it, of course, it's open enough to where the, the average player can play it without a whole lot of difficulty. It's just... Uh, there's just very few birdies made on the hole because of the length. Uh, if you hit the ball past the hole, then you've got a pretty slick putt coming back down the hill. On, in most instances, the green is pretty fast most of the time, and it makes for a pretty slick putt coming back down the hill. One of the favorite golf holes in Montgomery is the par 4 10th hole here at Bonnycrest. It measures 451 yards in length. And it requires a real long uh, and accurate place tee shot. You can't hit the ball too close to the trees on the left. You're blocked for a second shot to the green. And if you blow it out to the right too far, then you, it can go out of bounds or you can be in deep rough uh, 225 yards from the green. And another long and accurate second shot you know, to a well-bunkered green. Hey. If you hit an accurate, good golf yeah. shot into it, it'll hold it. I'd rather be below the hole on, in most any instance because it gives me an opportunity to you know, maybe make a little bolder uh, stroke at the putt. Another favorite of local golf professionals is the 448-yard par-4 eighth hole at Arrowhead. Even after this career drive, I still had 205 yards to the hole. Again, placement of the tee shot is critical. You've got to hit it about 250 to 275 off the tee, and it leaves you with a mid-iron into the green. If you miss the green on the side that the pin is cut, you've got yourself a very delicate uh, chip shot and, uh, and putt. It's hard to get the ball up and down. A lot of people just, you know, in, in tournaments like to take four in this hole and just go to the ninth hole. Some Charger fans may wonder why Air Coriel would want an infantryman like 250-pound Pete Johnson. He doesn't exactly fit the Charger image. He's a mountain of a man that can pick up four yards simply by falling forward. Now, the Chargers don't play that kind of football. They're known for their air-it-out kind of offense. Well, guess again. The Chargers would like nothing more than to have a little four yards and a cloud of dust in their bag of tricks. Don't worry, Johnson will see his share of passes, but he'll mean much more to the Charger offense. I think he's proven he can catch the football, although I, I think we all realize that his strength lies in being able to run the football inside. I mean, that's where his real strength lies. Uh, he did that in college real well. He's done that at Cincinnati well. But he's also caught the football at Cincinnati, and uh, he's the, a real fullback type. Ray Boom Boom Mancini spent many lonely hours in the high altitude around Lake Tahoe earlier this month getting ready to defend his WBA lightweight title against Livingstone Bramble Friday night in Buffalo, and the pride and joy of Youngstown, Ohio, thinks the time is well spent. This will be his fifth title defense. He won the last three with devastating early knockouts, yet it will be different. Hype is hype, but Mancini and Bramble, the top contender, genuinely dislike each other. Hey, Bramble, I don't care for the kid, but I gotta still go in and do my job, concentrate the way I'm gonna concentrate, and not let this get, you know, get me off track, so... 
No, uh, yeah, I don't care for him too much, and I'll take care of that in the ring. I'm not trying to hide. He comes around me, and I'm going to smack him. There's no, no buts and no if about it. That's the way I feel, and that's the way I'm going to generate until the fight is over. Mancini says he has finally gotten over the November 1982 tragedy when Dooku Kim died as a result of two vicious rights to the head. And Bramble's references to Mancini as a killer, understandably, have not gone over big in the Mancini camp. We have the highest regard for Lou Duva. He's an excellent manager. He's an excellent trainer. His record speaks for itself. He just has the misfortune in this case of managing a fighter who is a despicable human being. In May 1940, it took the German army only five days to take over Holland, and if young flyers like Vanderstock ever hoped to fight for their country, they'd have to do it with the Allied army. I, I escaped from Holland uh, three times without success. I just didn't get out, and it was almost impossible. And the fourth time, I made it and went to England. Two years after becoming a Spitfire fighter pilot, he was shot down over France and put into a so-called German escape-proof prisoner of war camp. Two years later, Vanderstock and 75 other officers proved the Germans wrong by breaking out of Stalag Loop 3. A book and a movie, The Great Escape, were based on their ordeal. Vanderstock says he was amazed with the security the POWs maintained during the year it took to dig an escape tunnel. The Germans did not find that tunnel ever. We made many tunnels before, but this one was never found. Vanderstock was the 18th officer to go through the tunnel. He received high priority because of the role he played in the escape plan. He was the forger, responsible for making fake documents and bribing guards. He says his most anxious moment during the escape is when he handed his bogus documents to a German border guard before crossing into Holland. The only true thing on that paper was his initial when he said, OK, you go through. Everything else was painted on and then false. In fact, I made that myself. And that, that is a very tense moment. Vanderstock was one of only three original escapees to make it all the way to freedom. He says a lot of that was luck, and that he must have had a guardian angel looking out for him during the entire war. Don Phelps, WSFA-TV News on the Military Beat.